covered a historical postcard that was printed around the turn of the century that was a duplicate of a glass slide photo that the Peabody Museum took during their excavations here. And it was of the skeleton that had his legs cut off at the knees and his hands cut off. And the caption on the, on the postcard was, skeleton seven feet in length found in the mound. Once I uncovered that postcard, Ross Hamilton used it in one of his books. And from there, in one of his books on the Giants, it has caught like wildfire across the, you know, the Giants world and appeared in all kinds of publications about the Giants and stuff like that. But here's the thing. All we have is that caption. We don't really know how big that skeleton was. So when I started this project about going to the Peabody and uncovering all of the uh, artifacts and, and all of the glass photo, plate photos that they had taken, uh, I got all the excavation photos, including that one of the guy cut off at the knees. And the problem with examining that photo is there is nothing in the photo that you can use to scale, right? You can't, there's no artifacts next to them that you could measure that you could then say, okay, that's how big this guy is. All we know is that ostensibly the guy was seven feet. What does that mean? He's seven feet from his knees to the top of his head, in which case he's taller than eight feet? Or was, were they trying to estimate the, um, you know, how big he was, the missing portion? We don't know, right? It's just sort of a mystery. But, there was a skeleton, the main burial in the mound, which is an, another Adena burial, that was laid out on the bed of ashes. That's the slide that you're referring to. And there are actually two, two photographs of that burial, one from the left side, one from the right side. And in both photographs, there are artifacts next to the skeleton, next to the human remains, that you can scale. And I hunted those artifacts down in the Peabody archives that have the scale measurements with the photograph of the artifact. And so it's a really simple thing. You can measure the artifact on the screen. I use the program called Screen Calipers. It measures the pixels. And then you measure not just the artifact, you can measure the skeleton. They have, you know, it's basically a perpendicular measurement, a photograph of the skeleton, one from the left side, one from the right side. And I measured from the top of the skull to the ankle. I didn't include the feet. I only went right to the top of the ankle. So from the top of the head to the ankle, you get a measurement. Screen calipers make that measurement. You have the measurement of the artifact. Then you know the true measurement of the artifact. You know how big it is in inches or in centimeters. And then it's just a simple algebra equation, solve for x. How big is the skeleton? And it turns out that skeleton in there, the, the big one that has you know, all the parts to the skeleton, was eight feet, nine inches tall. Okay, now, that's much bigger than the seven foot report. So it may be that the other skeleton really was seven feet, we don't know. Um, since that time, I found two other pieces of evidence that lend some support to that. Um, one was I came across a newspaper article written um, before 1910 where a group of schoolgirls came to Serpent Mound for, uh, for a visit and they were given a tour by the caretaker of the mound. His name was Wallace. And Wallace was here at Serpent Mound and helped on the dig when the Peabody did their excavations between 1886 and 1889. And after 1889, he was subsequently hired to be the caretaker of the site. And so he was here through the, uh, or the 1890s, and then when the Ohio Historical Society received the site ownership from Harvard, Ohio Historical Society hired him to be the caretaker, and he was the caretaker here until 1914 when he died uh, during World War I. So this is somewhere around 1910. It gets these visitors, schoolgirls that come here, and this gets reported in the Portsmouth newspaper. Um, and in there, they talk about that the caretaker reported to these girls, remember this is like 1910, that when he was here, they had excavated a skeleton out of the large conical mound that was bigger than seven feet tall. So it's not just some 
wild story. We have an eyewitness to it who was here during the excavations, helped in the excavations reporting that. And that was reported in the newspaper. We also have a story that appeared in the New York Times in 1894-95. There was an excavation that was done one mile north of Serpent Mound across the, uh, into Highland County, just across the Highland County, Adams County line. And this farmer had several mounds on his property. They were excavated and he found several burials of people who were taller than seven feet. So this is, you know, there were people in and around this area that were at least that tall that were being buried in these mounds. And so that's what we know at this point. What I do know is that once that story came out and then spread like wildfire and all of the nonsense that's been talked about that that, uh, original postcard, is that um, Brad Lepper wanted to put the kibosh on all of that. And so he contacted the Peabody and asked them to make a measurement of the femur of the skeleton in the mound. And there are these anthropological methods that can extrapolate the height of the person based on the size of the femur. And so he got, him the, he got a measurement from them and he then did the extrapolation. He said the person wasn't taller than six feet. But here's the issue. I asked them which skeleton did they make the measurement from? They didn't tell him. There were at least 10 skeletons that came out of the mound. So we have this vague measurement of a femur of one of the 10 skeletons that came out of the mound, and it turns out that person was six feet tall, roughly. So we don't really know at this point whether we can confirm the eight feet, nine inches. We just can do that based on screen measurements, Um, but that's as far as we can tell at this point. Jason Gerald and Sarah Farmer's book, Ages of the Giants, they go into quite amount of detail as to the possible motive for why that cover-up happened. And they talk about how most of the people that were involved in the Smithsonian and a number of the other major institutions, they were all members of the American Eugenics Society. The American Eugenics Society was a society that was put forward that basically was white people are at the top of the the evolutionary scale. And evidence for people who may have been of greater stature, who may have been as brilliant, if not more brilliant than us today, evidence for that was frowned upon, right? That was why the cover-up happened, was because at the time in the 18... 60s and 70s and 80s when the Smithsonian was going around digging up mounds and and finding these tall tall stature people, the federal government was still engaging in warfare against Native American tribes, particularly in the in the in the you know near western states. And so they had to have some justification for those wars to seize those people's land, to embark upon that genocide. And the and the archaeological finding of these people's prehistoric ancestors were, you know, maybe evolutionary, maybe a a step above us, that really, you know, puts the federal government in a precarious position. And and, and so that's, I think, maybe why the cover-up may have occurred. Um, Or at least, yeah, that whole, that whole idea. Darwin, social, scientific Darwinism, social Darwinism played a big role. That's, those are all tenets of, a, of the American Eugenic Society. And you look at John Wesley Powell, he was a member. You look at all of the major key figures in those, they were all members. You know, so um, they were rounding up the skeletons and sending them to the Smithsonian. And they were doing those, you know, sort of racial studies of, you know, the cranium capacity of people and making... Uh, you know, social judgments about the intelligence level of people based on their cranial capacity, which is totally bogus. But those were all these sort of racial arguments that were, you know, coming to the fore. And remember, this is all in the aftermath of the Civil War, you know, uh, and so there's a lot of this social racial animosity that's taking place in, in, you know, Jim Crow laws are being passed and all that kind of nonsense. So, you know, it's part of the dark chapters of, you know, American history that that took place. 
and we're just beginning to come out of it, right? We're just beginning to find this stuff over, you know, in the last few years and now beginning to start making some sense of it.